What's going on, everybody? It's Monday. Time for Swift News. Yeah, we're back. We're going to do this uh, once every two weeks. I'm going to be tweaking the format over the first few episodes, trying to dial in this, this new look and feel of the show. If you're a newer subscriber, this is a show I used to do. Uh, we did this every week. Uh, and if you enjoy this, I encourage you to go check out the Swift News playlist on the channel. I think we did like 75 episodes of this. It was a long running show uh, and we're bringing it back. Uh, this episode is going to be a bit of a rapid fire, so it may not be the norm, um, but you know, I've been gone for a while, so a lot of stories have built up over that time. Uh, speaking of, here's the topic list. Timestamps will be in the description, as well as links to all these stories. All right, let's see if I remember how to do this. First up, we have the Swift 5.3 release process. Now, in my absence, Swift 2 was released. We won't cover that because that happened a while ago. Um, but now let's talk about Swift 5.3. And really the main thing you need to know, as you can see here, is uh, this release will expand the number of platforms where Swift is available and supported, bump it up, adding support for Windows and additional Linux distributions. So of course, link in the description, feel free to read this, but the main highlight is that as of Swift 5.3, there will be official support for Windows. So pretty cool to see that Swift is, is slowly expanding. You know, I, I've said this many times before, Swift is still a baby, right? It's only been around for four or five years. So uh, we're starting to see this expand on other platforms. I'm a little biased, of course, but I think the future of Swift looks great and we're starting to see it spread its wings a little bit. That was a weird pun that wasn't planned. Swift spread its wings. That was horrible. I'm not gonna edit it out. Here we have a much needed official tutorial from Apple and that is creating a Mac OS app using Swift UI. I say it's much needed because Mac OS tutorials out on the internet are, are few and far between. It's a very underserved category. So it's great to see Apple coming out with a Swift UI tutorial all about creating a Mac OS app. And if you're familiar with this, this is this new kind of tutorial form that Apple came out with uh, for Swift UI. A lot of people praised how good these tutorials were, very visual, step-by-step. -step. As you can see on the right, the, the picture is changing as I scroll down walking you through the whole process. Um, and again, it's great because this is building a Mac app in Swift UI. Again, very underserved. So if you've ever been curious about building a Mac app, uh, this is a great place to start. And that Mac OS tutorial is a great segue into universal purchases. So this is a relatively new thing. This happened while I was gone. It's not brand new, uh, but anyway, you can distribute iOS, iPadOS, watchOS, macOS, tvOS versions of your app as a universal purchase. So essentially what that means is on an app store, you'll have one price, they'll buy your app and they get it on whatever platforms you support, right? No more having to buy the Mac app, having to buy the iPhone app, having to buy the iPad app in some cases. Most of the time, if you have an iPhone app, you get the iPad app for free, but some cases they are separate purchases. Um, and this uh, article here will tell you how to do it, some considerations to choose from. If you wanna support the iPhone and iPad, you just basically support both devices and you get that. It'll tell you how to do it with the Apple Watch. You know, Mac Catalyst app, you kind of get it for free as well if you're building a new app now. And if you have an existing app, you can add multiple app records to that uh, in order to get that universal purchase. So if universal purchase is something that fits the app you're, you've built or you're building, definitely check out this article to read about universal purchases. And as always, links are in the description. Another recent release was iPad OS 13.4, and then subsequently the release of the Magic Keyboard, which gives trackpad and pointer support to iPad OS. I just got my Magic Keyboard a couple days ago. I'm loving it so far, but I'll admit small sample size of usage, but it really transforms the experience on the iPad. Um, that's all I'll say about that. This is not a Magic Keyboard review. What this is about is the human interface guidelines. If you don't know what the human interface guidelines are, that is a document from Apple that sets their standards, how to use things within the iOS, iPadOS, macOS uh, ecosystem. I have a video on that. I'll, I'll link to that in the description as well on like what it even is, if you're not familiar. But pointers in iPadOS, here you go. Here's the HIG, human interface guidelines, all about how to properly use pointers and the interactions in iPadOS. And you even got these little GIFs that will uh, animate as they're describing it. Uh, so here you go, play. This will talk to you about the, uh, the content effect, right? Because the cursor changes, based on what it's over, right? You see here in this little animation, it's sliding up into a text field. So you get the little like text cursor rather than the pointer. Um, so it'll show you how to do that. So this is very long. We're not gonna go through the whole thing, um, but if you're implementing trackpad support and cursor support into your iPad app, uh, this is an absolute must read. So you implement that correctly. 
Next up, we have the new developer app from Apple, which was formerly the WWDC app. But as you can see here, it's now called developer. So we'll tap into that and I wanna showcase this discover tab. Of course, you have the other tabs on the bottom, videos, WWDC, if you wanna watch all that. But I wanted to showcase the discover tab because Apple is starting to put out kind of like content, if you will, right? Meet the developer, uh, Philip Lamb, you can tap on this. He's a developer of homecourt.ai, really, really cool app, especially if you're into basketball. It's basically AI, as you shoot your shots, it'll build shot charts for you and all this stuff, but you can hear his story. And I really love seeing this kind of stuff, right? You can see the, the initial sketches on pen and paper of what turned into the app. But again, back to the Discover homepage, I would just check on this periodically. It looks like they're releasing articles every couple days, um, you know, design launch screens for seamless starts, how to implement state uh, UI state restoration. The app store expands to 20 countries. So it's kind of like they're, like I said, they're creating content. Here's more meet the developers. This is of the carrot app, the, the funny weather app, um, you know, the pencil kit, all that stuff. So anyway, I was neglecting this app completely. I would only open it up during WWDC, but now it's an app I check on a regular basis because they're starting to share some interesting stuff in there. So I wanted to point that out for you. Here we have an article from Wesley, uh, things I believe about software engineering. And it's, it's more of just a real quick list than an article, but I, I really uh, enjoyed a lot of these. And it looks like a wall of text because I have my text blown up on the screen, but you know, writing non-trivial software that is correct for any meaningful definition of correct is beyond the current capabilities of human species. And he does preface this article with like, these are like his extreme opinions. He, uh, so I expect reasonable people to disagree with me and that's okay. So these are not like, this is how it is. This is his opinions. And if you disagree, that's fine. You're allowed. Again, I don't want to uh, convey this as like, these are the way software should be. This is just you know, one person's opinion. Peak productivity for most software engineers happens closer to two hours a day rather than eight hours. I would actually agree with that. I would, I would say I can knock out code good code for like four to six hours a day and it's, it's it's like a curve right like at the top of that peak he's probably right about two hours is like in the zone knocking it out and then the other hours might be you know not peak performance but i kind of agree with that here's a big one thinking about things is a massively valuable and underutilized skill most people are trained to not apply this skill like i take walks every morning usually i'm listening to a podcast but a lot of the times I'm just walking, you know, either thinking about the YouTube business or, or if I'm building an app, you know, a certain implementation, just thinking, right? Like I think writing the code is the easy part. Thinking about it, kind of building it in your head, like that's the skill they're talking about. And I completely agree with that line. All right, just one more, just one more. You can go th uh, read the list here, but the amount of sleep you get has a larger impact on your effectiveness than the programming language you use. Uh, I agree with that one too. I've, I've worked on low sleep and I'm definitely, definitely less uh, performant there. So anyway, check out this article. I really enjoyed it. Again, I know some some topics trigger people. Just remember, these are just as opinions. Reasonable, pe reasonable people can disagree. That's perfectly fine. Next up, we have a project from NS Hipster, uh, Xcode build settings. We've all seen this screen right here. It's a little bit intimidating. Like I know when I'm digging deep into this screen, like I'm probably following a tutorial or Stack Overflow. Like, yeah, it's a little scary sometimes. Well, this is a good reference for the build settings. And as you can see up here, there's a nice search feature that you can search for a specific one. And what it does is it gives a more detailed description of you know what you're doing, right? Additional SDKs, uh, and it'll give you what it means. And I'm gonna zoom out my screen real quick just to show you how long this is. Like, we're just I'm just gonna mash my scroll here. You can see, look how long this is. Look how much information is here. That is why uh, I highly, we'll just stop randomly here, right? Other text-based install API flags. I don't even know what that is. But uh, so you can see, I can grab the cursor here, scroll way down. This is a very, very vast uh, resource, which is why definitely use this search feature. But if you find yourself digging into these build settings for whatever reason, I recommend coming here and checking this out and uh, learning a little bit more about the thing that you're changing. I wanted to share a relatively new newsletter. Uh, they're on issue number six, and it is all about Swift UI. And it's by Majid here. He's a good follow on Twitter, putting out a lot of Swift UI content. So if you're interested in getting a lot of Swift UI blog posts and tutorials in your mailbox every Monday, which I think we all are interested in Swift UI, I highly recommend subscribing to this newsletter. Uh, here's an example of the latest issue, issue number six. So definitely check it out. 
GitHub's mobile app finally came out of beta and is available for everybody. Here you see some screenshots. Quick little blog post by Ryan Nystrom, leading the GitHub mobile team uh, at GitHub. Uh, so here's some things you can do. Triage your tasks, give feedback, review and merge pull requests. Here's an example of what it would look like on your iPad or your phone. Uh, and again, pretty, pretty short blog post, not much there, but uh, definitely go download the app, check it out. Next up, we have an article about how your app might be too fast and why. Really love this nice little 16-bit uh, animation here. But the concept they're talking about here is, is perception, right? Let's get into this here. Uh, imagine you're at a fancy five-star restaurant. Uh, you order your food, the waiters leave, and then one minute later, they come back with your plate. You'd be a little bit skeptical. Like, Wait a minute, aren't you going to like cook the food? I'm paying a lot of money for this plate. Uh, and it says... 47% of the people say they don't want to wait more than two seconds for a screen to load, but ironically, if your users are waiting for an important query, like a search, analysis, a report, they become skeptical if the calculation time is too short. Even if, you know, the phone, the computer can legitimately calculate it in like a nanosecond, it's the perception that important things should take a little bit of time. Of course, we're not talking making them wait 30 seconds, but, you know, just a little bit. And this article talks about that's why introducing a well-designed loading screen right after a key action can make your users feel better. Again, all about perception. So the solution is to slow it down a little bit. It's called the labor illusion effect. Uh, you, you trust and value important results more when you obtain them after a delay, even if the waiting time was faked. So if this concept kind of interests you, I highly recommend checking out this article. The example they give is like Tinder, right? You spend all this time making the perfect Tinder photo, and then as soon as you're done, they give you a match like instantly. And you're like, wait a minute, you just gave me a random person. Like, that's what it feels like. But if you do, you know, finding potential matches, and then it takes a couple seconds, and then you get one, it feel this Tinder is a, is a weird example, but it feels like, you know, they actually did some legit searching for you, and it was customized to you, rather than sending you a random person. Even if that super quick one that took 0.1 second was the legit search, it may not feel like it. So again, I highly recommend reading this article about the labor illusion effect. If you're in this situation, it may help out your app a little bit. Next, we have a very in-depth article about capture list, you know, strong, weak, unknown references, right? This is very common interview questions and a very fundamental skill that can trip up a lot of developers. Uh, this article is so in-depth, it comes with its own table of contents. So we're not gonna dig into it, you know, too deep. I'm gonna scroll through it a little bit just to give you a little feel for it. But, you know, you talk about strong, weak, and unknown references, uh, you know, strong reference cycles, how to avoid them, which is coming up next, you know, preventing them. Uh, how to declare capture lists, uh, all that stuff. So again, you're, you're almost always going to get asked the memory management, uh, you know, retain cycle question in a job interview, escaping versus non-escaping closures. So if you're a little bit shaky on this, or even if you feel like you know it, like rereading this very, very in-depth article can help solidify this concept. So again, links are in the description. Uh, go check it out. Next, we have our AR kit section. I like to include this in each episode uh, if I can. It's just fun to look at and imagine what the future can be. So here we have one from Vova. Uh, what you could do with the Apple card and like your balances, I'll play it here real quick. So you can see your all your information about the transactions. You can see him swiping the physical card. Like this is a really, really cool concept. It is a concept, it's not real, but I, again, I enjoy looking at these because it makes my imagination go wild on like what the future of AR could be Again, once we get those glasses, I've said it time and time again, AR is not going to take off, in my opinion, until we get some legit good glasses. But uh, it's fun to see all these prototypes and proof of concepts out there, again, to get that imagination going. And then finally, we got the LOL of the week from Joe Groff here. If you're an Apple developer and you're having trouble visualizing six feet apart, here you go. Auto-releasing unsafe mutable pointer. I like to think of uh, translates auto resizing mask into constraints, right? Tamic, uh, all these really long names that you, you run into. Uh, this, this, I legitimately laughed when I saw this in Twitter. I thought it was pretty funny. So that is the uh, the return of Swift News, the first episode. Like I said, this probably had more stories than than future episodes because I had a lot, I had a pretty big backlog. Um, but I am going to do this every two weeks, so every other Monday. Of course, that's a little trickier to keep track of than every Monday. So uh, if you want to know when this comes out, definitely subscribe or follow me on Twitter, as I'll be posting when new episodes go live. So there it is. We're back. I'm excited. I hope you're excited. Uh, we'll see you. Not next Monday, but the Monday after that. All right, see ya.